So we're going to look at, explain first what is a wireless LAN, a wireless local area network, <coughs> specifically focusing on IEEE 802.11 wireless LANs, which is a, a standard for wireless LAN. So we'll explain the difference between the standard, the name, and, and some of the terminology. Uh, and then we'll look at the, the different protocols used in wireless LANs and some details about the physical layer. And transmission. And throughout this we'll give some examples of some wireless LAN devices and, and how they operate. And your assignment will start, your assignment will have multiple parts. So actually uh, some mini or some uh, multiple phases. So three phases most likely where you do one phase, there's a deadline, you submit that and then you move on to the next phase. So like three small assignments. And they will involve using some wireless LAN access points. So you'll learn more through the assignment. First, some quick introduction to what we normally view as a wireless LAN, and what we deal with when we use a wireless LAN. The most common topology of a wireless LAN is that we have a client your laptop, your mobile phone, some mobile device, some cases fixed devices, but we call it a client, and it connects wirelessly with an access point. Okay? A device which then connects, usually via wires, onto a wired network. So what this example shows is this is a wireless link between client and access point, and the access point has a cable plugged into it which then connects onto some other network, some wired network. We're not going to focus on how this works. That's typically Ethernet, a wired LAN. For example, here we connect into a switch and maybe some other switches or a router, then that goes out to the internet. And on this switch, maybe some desktop PCs attached. But that's all the wired network. The wireless LANs, we're focusing on how do we communicate between the client and the access point via the wireless link. The connection from the access point to the rest normally is Ethernet, but in theory could be any technology. It could be uh, an ADSL link. Uh, it doesn't have to be Ethernet, but many of the devices that are available and available cheaply today take an Ethernet cable uh, as the wired link. So the terminology we use to refer to the, the end user device, the client, and the device that connects wireless, the wireless portion of the network to the wired portion is an access point. So an example of our access point. And you see them around because you connect the, them to use the, the SIT wireless LAN. You see them attached to the walls and ceilings. And as you can, may see, they have ports on the back to plug the wired LAN into. The, some terminology, uh, a wireless LAN is a general type of, of network, so a local area network using wireless technology. There have been multiple different <coughs> standards that have been created to implement wireless LANs. The most common one is the one that we use today, the standard. So the, let's, let's say the general name is wireless LANs, or wireless LAN. One of the, st or the standard that we use today, the set of standards, is called IEEE 802.11. In fact, there are many, many uh, individual standards within that family. So there are some 802.11a, b, g, some extensions, which we'll talk about later. But that's the standard, the standard or a standard for wireless LANs. In the past, uh, there were other standards available. You didn't have to use IEEE 802.11. There was another one which came out of Europe for a while called HyperLAN, but it just didn't take off. It wasn't popular. So the main technology used for wireless LANs today uses the standard IEEE 802.11.
the idea is that if your client implements that standard, and it should be able to communicate with any access point that also implements the standard. If they use a different standard, they may not be able to communicate. Another name or another term that you often hear is really a marketing term. Wi-Fi. So sometimes you'll hear them uh, effectively meaning the same thing. A wireless LAN, IEEE 802.11 and Wi-Fi. But wireless LAN is the general name. IEEE 802.11 is a specific standard. Wi-Fi is a marketing term. So there's an organization that uh, certifies products to, to be Wi-Fi certified. I don't know if this has any label on it, but many products may have a Wi-Fi sticker on them saying that they've been certified by some organization to be called Wi-Fi. Okay? But it's more of a marketing term. I will use all three of them, whichever one's easier. Uh, Sometimes Wi-Fi is easier to say than 802.11. So just some terminology about wireless LANs. Or WLANs is the other one, WLANs. Because, so here we have a wired LAN, Ethernet. Here's the wireless part. Really, 802.11 is concerned of how, how to get data across this one link, across this wireless link. So it focuses on, in our layered stack, two layers. A physical layer, which is how to transmit bits. We've got digital data. How to transmit bits as some signal, some radio signal across the air. So our medium is the air. We need to send some radio signal. That's the role of the physical layer. And then the data link layer, layer two, is how to make sure that that use of the medium is efficient. And especially one thing that comes into play and we'll spend a lot of time on is how do we share that medium when we have multiple people wanting to send data at the same time? When we have multiple laptops wanting to communicate via one access point, who gets to send first? And that's one of the roles of the data link layer. We will see some different specs, some specifications for equipment and standards as we go through this topic, but just some summary. And like some of my slides, this is getting a bit old, at least the data rates. Uh, this is when 802.11 was not so popular, but the most common standards, how fast do they support? What data rate? Well, in the past, it was 11 megabits per second was the maximum data rate. Most products today, like this one, support 54 megabits per second. And probably over the last two or three years, most devices you bought even support faster. 802.11n supports 300 megabits per second and even up to 600 megabits per second in some cases. So that we're talking about tens of, and nowadays hundreds of megabits per second as a data rate. That's the data rate. What you get when you send your data across the wireless link is, because of overheads, is usually much less. So the throughput that we achieve is usually around half of that. We'll, we'll do some calculations later, not today, but we'll see the relationship between the throughput and the data rate, but usually around, approximately around half of the data rate, and shared, which means the more people using that wireless uh, or, or communicating at the same time, the less an individual user will get. We need to divide that throughput amongst multiple users. So if we have, say, five users and we had a throughput for a total throughput of 25 megabits per second, approximately each user gets five megabits per second. We divide the total divided by each user. And we'll explain why that's the case. So we're really talking about end user throughput in order of tens of megabits per second. How far can we send? Indoor, meters, tens of meters. Outdoor, hundreds of meters. The distance, the transmission range, depends upon the 
as with all wireless communications, it depends upon the transmitter and the antenna on the transmitter, the transmit power used, the antenna on the transmitter. Similar on the receiver, the antennas used and the receive sensitivity, the capability of the receiver device. And especially on the obstructions, your signal needs to pass through walls. It will be uh, attenuated as it goes through walls. It will get much weaker and therefore you will not be able to transmit as far if we have different obstructions. So that's why indoors it's around tens of metres. Outdoors, when there are few obstructions, say in an open field, you can get hundreds of metres in, in transmission range. And with special antennas, you can get kilometres of transmission range. But typical cases in buildings, tens of metres. How much power do we transmit with? Usually around from 1 milliwatt up to around well, up to 100 milliwatts. So when my laptop transmits, it depends upon the laptop, the, the device, it's in the order of 30 or 50 milliwatts for my laptop. I cannot remember the value, but uh, we'll see later. Uh, typical devices in the order of milliwatts, tens of milliwatts, maybe up to 100 milliwatts. However, now you can buy special devices or some devices which will transmit at a higher power if you want to transmit over a larger distance. Why do we care about the power? All right, we care about the data rate because we know we'd like to send our data as fast as possible, download or whatever. Care about the range because I'll put an access point in my home, I'd like to get coverage of the entire home. So I care about how far it transmits. Why do I care about the power? Cost? Health? Okay. Cost? Uh, cost, okay, my, my device that transmitted a higher power may have a higher cost. Yeah, small cost. Health? Why, why health? <laughs> okay, if you transmit at high power signals close to the human body, it can have an effect on the body. But in terms of hundreds of milliwatts, even at one milliwatt, it's not going to, in most cases, have a, an effect. Uh, unless you have it very close to, very close to you, 100 milliwatts shouldn't be a problem. What else? Why, why do we care about the transmit power? The battery of the device has. The battery of the device, okay. If it's your laptop, especially your mobile phone, it runs on a battery. When you transmit, the higher the power you transmit at, the more of the battery you consume. Okay? The, the higher the transmit power, when you're sending data with Wi-Fi on, on your mobile phone, your battery will not last as long as if you're not transmitting data. So the higher the transmit power, the less time our battery will last. So that's important. The higher the transmit power, the further we can send as well. One thing that we don't often think about, but also the higher the transmit power, yeah, the further we send, and a negative of that is that the more people we may interfere with, and that can cause problem with performance. What else? Frequency. The frequency range that's the most commonly used with wireless LANs is 2.4 gigahertz, plus or minus a few... Uh, tens of megahertz. So the center frequency of our signals that we send are around 2.4 gigahertz. Another frequency band is around the 5 gigahertz, but that's not so common. But many products support it nowadays. This is in what's called the, it's an unlicensed band, it's the ISM band, which means industrial scientific, medical. The ISM band is an unlicensed band, a range of frequencies that you're allowed to use when, and you don't need a license to use them. So originally developed for, so for industrial purposes, to build their own, own wireless network and for testing, but generally used nowadays for uh, many consumer wireless technologies. Bluetooth, wireless LANs, for example. 
Unlicensed, you don't have to pay a, a license to use that frequency to transmit, meaning cheaper, and anyone can use it. And the fact that anyone can use it is also a disadvantage because the more people that use it, the, less, the lower the performance that you as a user will get. You have to share amongst everyone. So we need certain rules or, or procedures such that we can fairly share our resources amongst multiple users. So cheap, but uh, we have the problem that there's no control about who uses it. Anyone can use it. Security, are they secure? Link level security, that is sending from here to the access point, there are techniques available that provide satisfactory level of security. That is almost as good as we can hope for across a wireless link. There are some, so they use uh, the, for security we provide encryption of the data. That we encrypt, encrypt the data before we send it and then decrypt at the access point. So there are techniques like WPA, WPA2 that provide uh, satisfactory security for, for most purposes. However, you need to turn them on. You need to enable such techniques in your network for them to be take effect. If you don't use encryption techniques, then your network or your wireless LAN is considered insecure in that whatever you transmit, someone nearby can receive and see what you sent. So unless you explicitly use the security techniques, your network is insecure. So a quick summary of some characteristics of wireless LANs. We'll go through how they work and, and where some of this data comes from. Who, all right, most of you have used the wireless LAN here uh, on campus. Who uses one at home or in a dorm, a wireless LAN, on a regular basis? Most people, or some people at least, okay. Who has set up their own wireless LAN? A um, bit higher. Okay, so you've configured, configured an access point, for example, and, and set it up. So for those that haven't, that's what the start of your assignment uh, will, will involve. So it's not so hard. Next week, I will give you some access points. You'll form, form some groups and we'll get started on setting up your own wireless LAN. So, still on some terminology and some very basic concepts. So we have, we have an access point which connects our wireless link to our wired link and to the rest of our network. And we have clients that communicate wirelessly to an access point. We say that those clients associate with an access point. So there's a procedure to associate with an access point, association. And a client associates with just one access point at a time. You cannot be associated or in, in the normal case, you cannot be associated with multiple access points. You're associated with one access point. The, of course, having a single access point, because of the limited transmission range, we cannot have a single access point that covers all of this building. In fact, a single access point will not cover all of this floor of the building. So when we want to provide coverage to users larger than the transmission range, we use multiple access points. And that's what we have across this campus. Almost two or three per floor in some cases now. We have access points with the intention of providing coverage no matter where you are in the campus. So for a larger area, we use multiple access points. And they connect back to some wired switch a LAN switch, which then may connect onto either other switches, desktop PCs, and then out to the internet, which is not shown here. The set of clients, so for one access point, we may have multiple clients associated. The set of clients associated with an access point and that access point 
are called a basic server set, BSS. So this is one basic server set. This is another basic server set. Sometimes generally called a cell, but I think we'll refer to it as a, a basic server set. When we have multiple access points all operated by the same organization and all configured to, to work together, then the set of basic server sets, that is all clients, all access points, is called an extended server set. And it should be easy for a client to move between access points within the same extended server set. And there are mechanisms for doing that. That is, you're currently associated with an access point outstairs, uh, outstairs, outside, because that's nearby. But then you move, you're on your phone and you move. And as you move down the stairs, you associate with another nearby access point because you move outside of the range of the one on this floor. That process of changing your association from one access point to another is referred to as a handover. We hand over from one to another, from one basic server set to another. As long as they're within the extended server set, that's normally uh, quite easy. One thing you may have seen, or you, you actually all have seen, is that an extended server set gets a name, an extended server set ID, an ID, so we can recognize it. And the one that you use in SIT, WSIT, that is the name of the extended server set covering this campus. More specifically, it's called an extended server set ID, WSIT. So that's common across all the access points inside SIT. Each of them are configured, and there's a parameter in the access point that says select the ESSID, and all of them have been set to be WSIIT because they're all in the same extended server set. What else can we say about this? Uh, so we use wireless LAN. We use 802.11 to communicate from here to the access point. And then the access point most typically uses Ethernet to send our data via a wired LAN, maybe to a router, or maybe just to a desktop PC inside the campus, for example. So this may be my office PC. This is an access point out in the corridor. My laptop connects to the access point or associates with the access point, sends data to the access point, which then takes it and sends it across the wired LAN to some switch, eventually into my office and to my PC in the office. What's the standard used for wired, LAN, wired LANs? Ethernet standard? is IEEE 802.3. So that's the standard used for wired, wired LANs, or generally called Ethernet. So same organization, and they use the same tech or similar techniques. So there's very, a number of simil similar um, protocols used between the two, and also some other standards. And also, for example, the frame formats when you create, create a frame to send, there's a frame format used for wireless LAN and then it's converted into the frame format used for Ethernet. There are some similarities. And the addressing scheme used is the same. We'll see the, the address that your PC gets, not the IP address, but the hardware address. The hardware address of your PC is the same format as the hardware address used for your laptop, the wireless LAN interface. It's this 48-bit Ethernet address, or MAC address. What's next? 
about the standards 802.11. So, in fact, this, the family of 802 standards covers wide lands, Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, wireless LAN, which we're going to focus on, and many others. WiMAX, Bluetooth fits in there, Token Ring, older wide LAN, or wired networks. And within this 802, IEEE 802 architecture, the standards all follow some same uh, approach. That is, there's a physical layer standard, and in fact there may be many variants of the physical layer standard, and there's a MAC layer. What does MAC stand for? Say up there. MAC is medium access control. There's a MAC layer in each of the standards. And then there's a common logical link control standard used. And that's used this, what's called 802.2 .2 is used for all of them. It's the same for, for wired LAN as wireless LAN. Whereas for wireless LAN, there's a specific MAC protocol, MAC standard, and there's specific physical layer. Because sending data across a wireless link across a, a short distance or across tens of meters requires different techniques to sending data across a, a, a copper wire. And similar sending across kilometers in WiMAX requires or can use different techniques than in the wireless LAN. So they have different physical layer standards and in some cases different MAC standards. And then all the common logical link control. From what we will see in some of our examples, we will not see much about the logical link control. Uh, one thing in common is that they have the same hardware address format, the same address format. We will focus on these two, the physical layer and the MAC layer. So the physical layer and generally the data link layer. Getting data across an individual link. How do we do that? But within here, there in, or both of these are in fact multiple standards. Multiple uh, enhancements have been made over time. There's the original one made back 15 years ago. And then there's the, been, over that time there's been enhancements, improvements. And in, with respect to the standard, they, an, a letter is added to the end. And nowadays, there's two letters. We've, we've run out of the, the, we've got past Z, Z. So we have multiple different physical layer standards. There was, so I've tried to draw that here. There's the one MAC standard, which has been fixed, although there's been amendments, but the, the main technique has been fixed since the start. And there are multiple physical layer standards, which really have been improvements over time increasing the speed, the data rate. So the original one was simply 802.11. And then there were two improvements that came out at the same time, 802.11a and b. They used different approaches. 11a offered a data rate up to 54 megabits per second, 11b up to 11 megabits per second. So we refer to them as 11a and 11b. And then there are other improvements as technologies uh, and the cost of implementing them uh, got cheaper, technologies got better, 11G came out, and now 11N. Most new devices support 802.11N. N, the old ones, at least uh, maybe B and G, sometimes A. And there are newer ones, uh, AC and AD. In addition to the different physical layer standards, there are also improvements for other parts of wireless LANs. Improvements on security, for example, 11i. There, were, there was an original security standard, WEP, which had some flaws. It didn't work well in some cases. It was insecure, so they developed enhancements, improved security standards for wireless LANs. Providing quality of service, which is about, for example, making sure your voice traffic gets priority over your web browsing. 
So you can give some special service to some applications and lower service to other applications. How to do that? Managing the spectrum, the frequencies, and many others. So we're up to, I think, there's 20 or close to 30 different amendments uh, that are available now. And they keep working on new improvements. Sometimes they are called a standard, like the standard 802.11g, but more, more precisely it's called an, an amendment to the standard. It fixes the standard or changes the standard. We're not going to try and explain all of the enhancements or amend amendments. We'll talk about the differences between the main physical layers and focus on the, the common MAC layer. Before we go into how the physical layer works and some assumptions, let's look at my, my laptop and see what we have for our wireless LAN connection. So on my computer I can look at the configuration of my wireless LAN interface using this program IF config and the name of my wireless LAN interface WLAN0 and it tells me some information about my my interface, my network interface. What can you recognize there? What information does it tell you that you know about? Ethernet. What about Ethernet? Why has it got Ethernet there? In fact, no, this is, I don't have a wired, LAN, a wired cable plugged in. I've just got wireless access on the laptop at the moment. From the perspective of the operating system, the similarities between the 802, 802.3, 802.11, my operating system considers this, at least from a, a, the, the network layer perspective, as just a, a general Ethernet interface. The same as, that's my wireless LAN, and my wired LAN, although I've got nothing plugged in, the, in the method of encapsulation is also called Ethernet. They considered the same from the perspective at least of this program. This is my wired Ethernet interface, this is my wireless LAN interface. Focusing on the wireless LAN one at the top, what else may you recognize? MAC address. The hardware address. How many bits? How many bits? 48 bits. This is in hexadecimal. Each hexadecimal digit is 4 bits. So 12 hexadecimal digits. It's a 48-bit address. The hexadecimal is just to make it shorter to write down. It's actually 48 bits in length. So this is the hardware address of my wireless LAN interface. Normally with hardware addresses, they are assigned by the manufacturer of the device. When I buy, buy the laptop, there's a wireless LAN chip on the motherboard, in fact, and that comes with a hardware address uh, assigned by the manufacturer of that chip with the intention that they are globally unique. That is, another laptop that comes off the, the same production line, the next one, would have a different hardware address, a different MAC address. That's the idea. What else do you recognize here? All right, we have an internet address, so an IP address. So when I connect to the SIT wireless LAN, I get an IP address assigned to my laptop, 10.10.97.150. And related to that, a subnet mask to say which part of that internet address identifies the subnet I'm on, and that's identified by this 255.255.248.0. Although we're not going, this is outside of the scope of what we're covering. There's an IPv6 address uh, and some, some information about my interface, that it's up. Up means it's on. 
uh, some capabilities. It's running, it supports broadcast and multicast. MTU is the maximum transmission unit, the maximum size of data that I can transmit across this interface, 1,500 bytes. And some statistics about the number of packets I've received and transmitted, uh, including bytes. Okay. Now, it doesn't say much about the wireless LAN characteristics of that interface. It's all general. It's about an IP address, which is not specific to wireless LAN, a hardware address, which is not specific to wireless LAN, because my wired LAN has the same type of hardware address. So to look at something about my wireless LAN interface. Will you need hardware address uh, run out so that this every computer has different hardware address? OK. Uh, two parts. So I said that the hardware address should be, is intended to be globally unique. Will they run out? How many, in theory, do we have? Well, 48 bits gives us 2 to the power of 48. How many is that? Get my calculator. With a 48-bit hardware address, sorry, that's 2 by 10 to the power of 14 possible addresses. It's not quite that many because they're uh, structured in some way, but that's uh, what there are ten to the power of nine, or maybe ten to the say ten to the power of ten people in the world. So that's what ten thousand addresses per person. All right, it shouldn't run out just yet. So, uh, of course, this is not just uh, for um, laptops, but for wired wired devices, because the same address structure is used for wired LAN and other devices, mobile phones, uh, access points, many devices use them, but should be enough for the medium term. Okay? That's not a problem. But a problem may be, is, uh, may be and is possible that it may not be globally unique, because nowadays you can change using software the MAC address. At least you can set this, the MAC address of your device to be something else. So you could set the MAC address of your laptop be the, to be the same as mine. And therefore, it's no longer globally unique. So it's now possible to change when you send data to set a different MAC address. But when they're manufactured, the idea is that they will be globally unique. the way that that's provided, and some of you have seen this before, is that the manufacturer is assigned uh, an identifier, and that is the first six hexadecimal digits. And when the manufacturer creates a device, it assigns the last six digits. So in fact, the first six hexadecimal digits identify the manufacturer of the device. Let's remember what mine is. Uh, and bring up a website that tell us that may tell us the manufacturer. IEEE, the organization that manages these addresses, has a website. And you can search. Sorry, what was mine? 8CA982. So those first six digits in the MAC address should identify the manufacturer of my device. And we search their database, Intel. OK, mine's an Intel wireless LAN card. So Intel is assigned these six digits. And when they create each wireless LAN chip, they select the last six digits with the intention of them being unique. So you can look up who manufactured your device uh, from this IEEE website.
Let's look at some more details about the wireless LAN interface. So that another program I can use is IWconfig. IFconfig to configure my interface, my network interface. IWconfig gives me specifics about the wireless interface. And the name WLAN0. OK, now we see some details. What WLAN0, the standards it supports. Right, IEEE 802.11, it supports B, G, and N, so the different physical layers. B, so there was 802.11, the original one, and then two extensions, A and B. This one, my, my card supports B only, it doesn't support A. It also supports G and also supports N. And 11B, we'll see in some later slides, provides 11 megabits per second maximum. G, 54N, on my device, I think it's maybe up to 300 megabits per second. Which one does it use? It only uses one at a time, depending on what, upon what the access point supports. So if this access point which I associate with supports 11B and G, and my laptop supports B, G, and N, they'll most likely negotiate to use G. They could use B as well. But this, if this doesn't support N, then of course we cannot use it. Both need to support the same standard. And they can use either of them, B or G. And then it's up to you, the user, to select, do you want to use B or G? G is the faster of the two. My extended server set ID. Okay. I'm associated with an access point and that access point is using the, the WSIT ID. The mode managed is just to say that my interface is uh, connected to an access point. The managed mode means that uh, I'm a client and I'm in a mode that I'll only associate with an access point. There are other modes where you can connect direct from laptop to laptop, from client to client. Ad hoc mode, is it commonly called. So there's a different modes that you can use uh, wireless LAN. The most common one is client to access point, manage mode, as called by this software. The frequency I'm using, the precise frequency, 2.462 gigahertz. There are multiple different frequencies available to use in this 2.4 gigahertz range. So different channels available and you select and use one of them to communicate with the access point. The access point and the access point is identified normally by its MAC address, its hardware address. So the access point also has a MAC address and it's the same format, this 48-bit MAC address. So that's the identifier of the access point, sometimes called the BSS ID, the basic server set ID. The bit rate, the data rate, one megabit per second. Why one megabit per second? Because I haven't sent any data. If I access my website, and then run this command again. When I actually send data, it will move up to a higher data rate. So now it's reporting 54 megabits per second. So that's the data rate I most likely use to transfer that data. We will see that your, the wireless LAN devices can support a range of data rates, not just one. And they can automatically switch between them. The transmit power of my wireless LAN device, 14 dBm, how many milliwatts? Calculate the number of milliwatts that I transmit at. Anyone have a calculator or a mobile phone that can calculate? Fourteen dBm. How many milliwatts? 25 milliwatts. 
How do you calculate it? Ten to the power of one point four, and that dBm. Remember the general formula for decibels. The is ten log log in base ten of some power level. So some power in the absolute value and the power in dB. So in our case with dBm, dBm, the M stands for milliwatts. More precisely it should be written as, or it could be written as dB milliwatts. It's decibels relative to one milliwatt. So the way to work that out quickly is that the power level in milliwatts gives us dBm. So, if dBm, if we have, in our case, 14 dBm equals 10 log in base 10 of some power level in milliwatts. So therefore you just find out what P, P is, which is 14 divided by 10 is 1.4 equals log P and therefore P in milliwatts equals 10 to the power of 1.4 which is about 25 milliwatts. When we talk about wireless communications, transmit powers, receive powers, we often talk in, in uh, using a decibel scale. DBM is common with wireless LAN. It's the power level relative, because decibels is a, a, a ratio between two power levels. dBm means the power level relative to one milliwatt. 25 milliwatts divided by one milliwatt is a factor of 25. Convert into d, dB and you get 14, 14 decibels. So, my laptop transmits at 25 milliwatts which is a typical range of most, uh, at least, laptop uh, devices. 20, uh, 30 milliwatts, some may be higher powered. Re long, the retry limit, uh, RTS, fragmentation, we'll talk about, or we'll see them in a, later as we go through the lecture notes of how they come into play in the wireless lab, Mac lab. Power management is off. Power management is a feature that uh, you can turn your wireless LAN interface into a mode such that it sleeps in the idea of saving power, saving battery power. It sleeps in that uh, it turns off or goes into a low power state, an idle state for let's say a period of time, uh, half a second, and then wakes up every interval and checks with the access point whether there's any data to send or receive. So, in particular to receive. So, if there's no data to go between the laptop and the access point, it turns off the wireless LAN interface, saves power on your device. But what if there's some data that's come from the wired network to your laptop, then every so often your laptop turns on turns on the wireless device and sends a special message to the access point to check if there's any data and the access point informs it and if there is then it can wake up and receive that data. So there's a way for the, the wireless device to sleep as a way of saving battery power. It's off in my case. There's some statistics about transmit and receive packets and the last thing we may see is the link quality. Some measure of the quality of the the wireless signal being received by my laptop, received from the access point that I'm associated with, the access point identified by this address. 70 out of 70 in this case. And the measure of the received signal. So this is some, some relative measure, and this is the absolute measure of the received signal, minus 40 dBm, which is what? 10 to the 10 to the power of minus 4 milliwatts, which is 0 0.1 microwatts. 
So that's the signal strength of the, the, re the received signal strength for my laptop is, is this one and it gives some quality of level. That's considered very good. Okay. Any questions before we come back to our, our lecture notes? So just an example of some details that we can see about a wireless LAN. We've got a, a name of our network, extended service set ID, different addresses, different physical layers supported, data rate, transmit power. Let's look at the physical layer. We're not going to go into details about uh, how the physical layer standards work. Uh, we, some of us don't have enough background on, on some of the physical layer or the wireless communications to understand and uh, it's not so important to understand some of the aspects of performance in wireless LAN. We'll just talk about the characteristics, some of the specifications of the physical layer. and some general concepts. From our simplistic view, we think the physical layer takes bits, zeros and ones, from the data link layer and converts them into some radio waves that are transmitted from the antenna, from the transmitter to the receiver. How does that work? Well, there are different things that uh, the 802.11 physical layer defines is the modulation technique, the analog signal that is transmitted, how to shape that into some efficient form so that uh, we can send data at a high rate and that the receiver can receive it and understand what's transmitted. So different modulation techniques are available. It defines, the physical layer defines what frequencies to use and what bandwidth of the signal we should use. We've given an example of my laptop used a frequency of 2.462 gigahertz. The normal bandwidth used of a wireless LAN signal is 20 megahertz. I've drawn a diagram similar to this before. Let's try again. So this is the spectrum of the signal that I transmit, where we'd say the center frequency is 2.462 gigahertz. This is the frequency in gigahertz and this axis, and this is the power strength. When I transmit a signal, the signal actually has a range of frequency components, and the bandwidth is, that is from here to here, is the bandwidth is 20 megahertz. So in fact, here the lower point is about, what is it, 2.452 here, and this would be 2.472, because the difference would be 20 megahertz, megahertz or 0 0.02 gigahertz. So that's the signal transmitted by my uh, laptop. That is, in these frequency in this frequency range, the signal has high power. Outside of those frequency range, the signal has very low power, almost zero, or effectively zero. So I transmit across a range of frequencies. So the physical layer defines the bandwidth and the frequencies used. This we call the center frequency of that signal, and in wireless LANs, there are multiple different frequencies available to transmit at. We'll see a plot of that later, uh, the, the, the exact set of frequencies available. The other part defined by the physical layer is some timing or how to synchronize the sender and receiver. That is, when we transmit some signal, that the receiver can detect that this, that, that signal represents the, the, the first bits, or which signal represents the first bits of a frame, the start of a frame. So 
for some synchronization issues. We're not going to attempt to explain how they work. Okay. But what we care about are some practical characteristics of the different physical layers, the speed, the data rate, how many bits per second we, can we send with each physical layer? How far can we send? And we'll talk about, because it depends on different factors, the transmit power of, a, of the transmitter and the receive, receiver sensitivity. Transmit power is how much power I transmit with. That's easy. The receiver sensitivity is how weak a power can the receiver receive and still understand that data transmitted. What's the minimum power level it can receive and still decode or demodulate the signal and get the data out? So that's usually a characteristic of the receiver electronics and usually a specification of your equipment. The frequency and related to the frequency the number of channels available. I have a plot Let's see if I can find it. This illustrates the, the range of frequencies available in wireless LAN. I said 20 megahertz, or I, I was wrong, 22 megahertz here, yeah. to be more precise. That's the bandwidth of the signal. How do we read this? So we have frequency along this axis, and we can see that we have different channels available. So channel 1 through to channel 13. Depends upon the country and the, the regulations in that country as to what channels you're allowed to use. Typically, channels 1 to 11 are, are available, 1 to 13 in some countries. And, and sometimes it's different. But the most common channels we have is 1 to 11. And the channel is defined by the center frequency. For example, my laptop was using channel 11. I was using frequency 2.462 gigahertz. And this plot shows the bandwidth when we transmitted that signal. Do you have this picture? Yes, you do have this picture in your handouts. Towards the end of the... Where is it? It's at the end of your, the lecture notes on wireless LAN. Let's flip through a few pages. So it shows the different channels available for your wireless LAN device. And note, for example, on channel 6, transmitting at a frequency of 2.437 gigahertz, our signal has a bandwidth of 22 megahertz, shown here, the solid line. So that ranges from, so channel 6, the frequencies that we transmit at, at least at, at uh, significant power, ranges from 2.437 minus 11 megahertz to 2.426 up to 
2.448 gigahertz. That is a bandwidth of 22 megahertz there, a difference between these two of 0 0.022. That's from here to here. And there are other frequencies available you can transmit. On channel 5, 2.432 is the center, mega, center frequency. What's important here is that some channels overlap. That is, when you transmit on channel 5, you're transmitting a signal in this range, your, the frequency components that you transmit overlap with some of those, most of those in fact, with channel 6. What that means is that if my laptop is transmitting on channel 5 and someone else's laptop is transmitting on channel 6, a receiver that was trying to listen to my laptop, an access point on channel, six, channel 5, would also receive most of the signal from the other laptop. They would interfere with each other and in fact the receiver most likely would not be able to understand any of the data sent. They would cause some interference and the receiver could not decode the, the, the data being sent. So that's a problem. If there's two, station, two devices transmitting on overlapping channels, by overlapping I mean that the signal here overlaps because the bandwidth covers a range of frequencies. If there are two stations or devices transmitting on overlapping channels, a receiver will hear both of those signals and normally will not be able to understand either of them. So the non-overlapping channels is considered important and we see in this set that the main ones are channels 1, 6 and 11. Of those 11 or 13 channels available, channel 14 is a special case only available in some countries, of up to 13, the maximum number of non-overlapping channels available is 3. Even though there are 13 channels available, only 3 are non-overlapping. Using non-overlapping channels can significantly improve performance and we'll explain that shortly. Any questions on that picture then we'll, before we move back to the slides? It shows the channels available and it shows the bandwidth consumed by each and in particular it shows an example of three non-overlapping channels, channels 1, 6 and 11. So the frequency you choose to transmit at is important and in particular the set of non-overlapping channels is important. Let's just see where we can finish today. Let's look at some of the characteristics. Uh, there's this slide which goes up to 802.11n and then I've got another picture which shows two others, two, new, two newer standards. But this captures most of the information. This compares the different physical layer. So the amendments to the original standard. The original one, 802.11, released in 1997. The frequency, 2.4 gigahertz, or in the range of 2.4 gigahertz. The modulation technique we're not going to describe it uses a, a spread spectrum technique uh, for modulation. The, this is the non-overlapping channels available. Three non-overlapping channels. The more the better. What it means is with three non-overlapping channels is that we can have three different pairs of communications happening at the same time in the same area without interference. I could be transmitting to one access point on channel 1, another person transmitting to another access point nearby on channel 6, and a third transmitting to another access point on channel 11. And even though they are in the same vicinity, 
they will not interfere with each other because they're using non-overlapping channels. So that's an important practical characteristic, the number of non-overlapping channels available. Original maximum data rate supported was 2 megabits per second. And the range was approximately, it depends upon the building and so on, around 20 metres indoors, maybe 300 metres outdoors, approximate range. That didn't last long because as soon as that was released, the people who created the standard realised that it wasn't fast enough, that they could do better. And within two years, 11B and also 11A were released at the same time. So they provided two different options. 11B was released to be a uh, released to use the same approach as the original 80211 so that you could use uh, the, the similar equipment. It would be backwards compatible. 11B used the same frequency and in fact the same modulation technique, the same number of channels. And it provided an increase of the maximum data rate up to 11 megabits per second. And about the same range as the original one. Whereas 11A, released at the same time, higher data rate, much higher, five times higher, 54 megabits per second is the fastest we could send with 11A, more non-overlapping channels, a different modulation technique which led to the higher data rate. The main difference is that it used a different frequency band, 5 gigahertz. One characteristic of that higher frequency was that the, the transmission range was lower. We couldn't trans... Indoors, not much difference, but uh, it could be significant in some practical cases. But the main difference and a reason why 802.11b become more popular than A, A was faster, B was more popular. One of the reasons was the backwards compatibility. You could have, let's try and draw it, you could have a network. Let's consider a university or an organisation, SIT, which has, or an older organisation that had their network of access points throughout their building and many clients, many people had laptops. And let's say the laptops originally they supported the original 802.11 and so did the access points. What, what was supported by this upgrade to 11B because they used the same frequency, the same transmission scheme is that you could quite easily upgrade your access points to 11B and maybe some of your laptops were even upgraded and it was very easy to also support association between the old laptops using the original standard and the newer laptops using 11B with these newer access points. Because of they using the same frequency, this, the similar radios were used in the new access points. So just by upgrading the access points and some of the laptops, we can still use the old 802.11 in some of the laptops. It means you don't have to upgrade every piece of equipment at the same time. And we see that with 802.11G and also parts of 11N. Uh, we'll see that... Uh, but it's both frequencies. So 11G was the same. 11G was another improvement. Four years later released. Speed went up to 54 megabits per second. The key point, it was backwards compatible with 11B and the original 11, which meant that an organisation could upgrade some laptops and or access points to support B and G. And those access points could support laptops or clients using either 11B or 11G.
So you don't have to upgrade all of the equipment at the same time. And that's especially important to, to support uh, organisations that have already built a network. Rather than requiring every user to change their laptop, they can just upgrade the access points and as people get new laptops, they'll upgrade to the highest speed. Whereas 11A required a different radio, a separate uh, radio inside the access point and therefore people didn't buy 11A devices. It was faster than B, but not so widely supported. Nowadays, you can buy devices that support all of them. Because the, the electronics has become cheaper, the radios are cheaper, you can buy devices that support A, B, G, and N, all in the one device. Sometimes they have two different radios. So the speed is not always the most important thing that drives the, the acceptance of technology other factors import, uh, impact. 802.11n is the main one available today. It supports, and this is missing, it supports both 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. So add 2.4 gigahertz in here. It supports both. Higher data rates, in fact now up to 600 megabits per second, but it requires some, some special characteristics. The range, all around the same. Just to finish, uh, one last picture. This is similar uh, from the original 802.11, B, A, G, N, and the newer ones which are expected in the next year or two, 11AD and 11AC. But we see with B, A, G and N, bandwidth around 20 megahertz. N supports both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And N goes up to 600 megabits per second. Why? I had 300 megabits per second in my table. N supports the case of you, you can use twice the bandwidth. Normally, 20 megahertz is used, but N supports you can use it, you effectively double that bandwidth. You transmit a much wider bandwidth signal, gives us double the data rate. So they're the most common ones today. The next two are almost for very speci special purposes. Uh, use completely different frequencies, 2.1 gigahertz, Oh, sorry, 60 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. The 60 gigahertz is for very, very short range communications. Centimeters, maybe a meter. Okay. For, say, video transfer over a very short range. We're talking about gigabits per second there. But they're expected in the future. And the uh, AC still using 5 gigahertz, but again, much higher bandwidth used. What we'll do next week is we'll talk about why, for example, using multiple ch non-overlapping channels can improve performance and how the interference affects uh, uh, the performance. And then we'll focus in detail about the MAC layer, medium access control layer. Enough for today.